one of our last stops as far as our UK tour is the Solent Sky Museum more or less a military slash industrial history museum showcasing Southampton's involvement with military and I think there's a uh, police and fire museum in here as well uh, we're waiting for them to open up but standing outside we already have a couple of show pieces to look at one being an artillery piece for starters and the Cal shot spit light ship that was used for helping to direct maritime traffic on the water instead of an actual lighthouse propped up in the middle of the bay they would use light ships which can be moved around as need be to mark where ships need to go as far as deep water channels and all this ship was retired a good while back like sometime in the 80s I believe but uh they moved it here in 2020 and well here it is they might look kind of big when you're standing right up to them but in ship terms they're actually kind of small but here it is light ship gonna go on and see if we can get inside and look at some more stuff stand by We are now inside the museum. Just checked in. Got a cool little motorcycle right here. A Honda Goldwing. Jet fighter flying boat. World's only jet fighter flying boat. SRA-1. First pre-production Martin Baker ejection seat. Cool. See some other equipment here. Firefighting equipment. Oh, generator. Let's see what this plane is. De Havilland Vampire T11. Side by side, two seat trainer. The wings, boom, and tail are made of metal but the fuselage is made of wood Napier double scorpion engine liquid fuel rocket engine each generating 8,000 pounds of thrust Fitted to English Electric Canberra WK-163, enabling aircraft to set world altitude record of 70,000 feet in 1957. And this plane, in particular, is still airworthy. The one that this engine was in. Foland Nat F-1. Designed as an affordable, lightweight fighter. That is this plane right here. Metropolitan Vickers Burl. The first jet engine of power a flying boat designed specifically for the SRA-1, which is the big plane we were just looking at right here. Another jet engine used in the SR-45 Princess Bristol Bra Brabazon, but was seriously underpowered. But it was more successful in the Bristol Britannia. This plane right here, part of a turboprop setup, entered service on the London-New York route in 1957. Another angle to our flying boat jet fighter looking at another display right here we have an ejection seat 
a lightweight ejection seat for the Fola Nat TMKT Mark I trainer. The Havlin DH110C Vixen. This is a plane I always thought had a cool look to it. Twin engine carrier based fighter which served from the 50s through the 70s. Achieved supersonic speed in a shallow dive. Do a walk around to this plane. Avro Aircraft Company, which made a lot of British aircraft. They even made these cool little mono cars, by cars, more or less a motorcycle, but it was built up like a car. Kind of cool looking. Of course, they also made the Lancaster Bomber, which played a important role in played an important role in World War II, dropping a lot of ordnance on. Germany and their allies. The Avro Aircraft Company made many innovations in their designs of aircraft the same way as we did. Once we started developing aircraft on both sides of the pond, technology advanced more and more, obviously, from the more primitive looking biplanes such as that, or that, Started working up to some of your first bombers. Engines got more powerful. You even worked your way to auto gyros or gyrocopters, which are kind of like a hybrid aircraft, uh, combining the characteristics of a fixed wing aircraft with that of a helicopter. Of course, as aircraft proved themselves in the First World War, they became a fixed piece of military equipment. Like I said, Lancaster Bomber being one of the prime examples. Fighter planes and bombers. Once aircraft became a mainstream piece, war changed forever. Here's a good shot of the rear end of the Sea Vixen along with a couple of engines. Here's a bunch of engines right here. Different internal combustion piston engines as well as turbine jet engines. Turbojet. Orpheus turbojet. That would be that one, it says Orpheus on it. Six-cylinder Rolls-Royce Continental. I would think that's that one. Yes, Rolls-Royce. That would be that one. Four-cylinder, 6.8-liter helicopter engine. I would think it's this one right here. It appears to be a four-cylinder setup. Yeah, Rolls-Royce Derwent. Turbojet. Used in the Meteor F3. It's also used in the Jet Airliner too. Gloucester Meteor. That was the plane. Armstrong Sidley Bristol Viper. Another turbojet. 2400 pounds of thrust. That would be this little plane right here. It was actually used for robot target aircraft at one t at one point, or in business jets. Supermarine Swift, Swift F4 interceptor. An engine. Let's see what's this one right here? Leonite Leonidas. Major 701, 
14 cylinder radial engine, supercharged. Rolls Royce Merlin, the Spitfire's main power plant. 1030 horsepower. Think that'll fit under the hood of a car? We actually have part of the fuselage of a Supermarine Seagull seaplane, wooden hull amphibious plane. Interesting. Of course, as planes advance, they even race them. Racing seaplanes and flying boats between 1913 and 31. I guess that's a little trophy that they would give. Of course, I guess part of the concept of racing was to be able to impress different entities that would want to buy the designs of these planes for military use. There's another seaplane right here. Supermarine S6A. It was one of the racing planes. And of course, what we got here is the iconic Spitfire. The fighter plane that helped win the Battle of Britain. Fast plane, and a heavy hitter. Here's its power plant Rolls Royce Merlin X or Merlin 10. 1100 horsepower engine. Heavy horsepower, fast plane. Give a good walk around. We have a prop salvaged from a Junkers Ju-88 bomber, twin-engine bomber from the German Air Force. We also have some other power plants salvaged. They clearly look like they've been underwater. Sunderland Mark III, ML883. They pulled them out of the water and got them cleaned up so they could stay preserved. We have us a beachcomber seaplane. Passenger plane. It was invented. Good size setup. Get to go inside of it. Flying boat. Have a little, have a little toilet right here. Passenger airliner, but a seaplane. Plane wasn't necessarily super huge, but still sufficient. We have our freight baggage hold area, which, I mean, for what it is, for the number of people, it was sufficient. We'll go up to the upper level. Which of course had more seating space. Not a lot of headroom, but still sufficient. 
a little mini kitchen area. On an extra long flight, they could whip up some coffee or drink or anything for the passengers. Ironically, the uh, crew quarters was actually in the baggage hold area. I'm assuming, based on this picture, they had little hammocks or bunks that they could pull down in order to set up their sleeping quarters amongst the baggage. Interesting. As we can see, the beachcomber is a pretty comfortable plane. Rather large, but a comfortable plane all in all. Four engine aircraft. As stated before, those airplane races were to determine who was a suitable candidate for building the next wave of fighter aircraft for the country and of course that's how the Spitfire came to be. They pretty much won the contest and the contract and the rest is history. Supermarine Company is the one that built the Spitfire. They were founded in 1913. PB-9 was the first one to fly. And they were used for attacking Zeppelin airships high altitude. Supermarine Channel, like another amphibious aircraft. It seems like a lot of what they made were amphibious aircraft. Way more versatile. Sea Eagle, Imperial Airways first flying boat. Another commercial amphibian, Supermarine Seagull, Supermarine Walrus, Supermarine Southampton, and Strand Rare. I'm probably butchering that name, but there it is right there. Supermarine Air Yacht. They were originally wooden hauled aircraft and then became aluminum for lighter weight had enclosed cockpits also an interesting thing that they kind of serve like flying lifeboats for pilots shot down in the ocean which would have been an obvious use for seaplanes you could land on the water pick up the pilot stranded in the ocean and take right back off again had a prototype Spitfire aircraft, Type 224, and then the actual prototype Spitfire. That was in 1936. And then from 36 to 38, they actually started cranking them out. Mark 1 model Spitfires with three bladed props. One was tried to be modified for an unsuccessful world speed record attempt. And then of course World War II started and the planes were ready to rock and roll. They even had a small number of them fitted with floats to allow them to operate from water in areas where there were no airfields. Mark, Mark 6 was a high altitude version fitted with a pressurized cockpit and extended wing tips. <laughs> a publicity stunt had him delivering barrels of specially brewed Spitfire beer to the troops in Europe. From 42 to 45, the planes just continued to advance. Mark 12, Mark 24, they just got faster and faster. The Mark 24 PK-683 was in active service with the Air Force before going on public display at Solent Sky. And that would be... The little number right in front of us. Of course, during World War II, all industrial areas were targets for German bombing. 1940, Supermarine in Southampton was bombed for the final time. The factory was destroyed, so production had to be relocated to other remote sites make it a little bit harder to stop full production if all the uh, production is spread out 
to multiple areas versus one central point. Southampton Airport was also bombed. Of course, they had some captured German aircraft in there before and after the bombing. And of course, the airport and factories were not the only targets of German bombing. The city as a whole was a target. Have a little model of High Street, Southampton, circa 1930. From 39 to 45, British cities such as Southampton were heavily bombed. Not just regular military targets, but civilian targets were destroyed just as well. And of course, even churches were not immune from heavy bombardment. A lot of those ruins that we've seen that look like they were ancient ruins are actually some of the churches from the war that were bombed and destroyed and were left there in that condition as a reminder of the destruction from German bombing. As stated, civilians were definitely not immune from this bombardment as could be seen. Different suburbs of Southampton were destroyed. Civic Center was hit, killing a number of children. Houses and other residential areas damaged by bombing. Even a picture of a car blown onto a roof of a structure because of a bomb explosion. Insane. Of course, after the war, Supermarine continued in their innovation, namely jet fighters. The Supermarine Swift set a world absolute speed record in 53, flying at 737 miles per hour. That would be this little plane right here, under a level of restoration. Pretty cool plane even started a movie. Of course they took the time to make sure that their whole process from the design phase all the way to construction was meticulously done. Even all the way to the particular rivets used. They had a color-coded grid stating between certain times only rivets from the specifically colored bins could be used. It would be 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. So two hour span you use yellow box rivets, 10 a.m. to noon, brown, and so forth. Or on the other inverse end, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. you're on the yellow, 10 p.m. to midnight, brown. Have a little display of the factory here, a little model. Where they're building planes. We even have a 20 millimeter cannon jig for alignment of the gun. Then we have a Rolls Royce Avon jet engine fitted in the Supermarine Swift turbo jet engine. Several planes were powered by this engine. Canberra, Hawker Hunter, Supermarine Swift, the Saab Draken, Ferry Delta II, De Havilland Sea Vixen, Vickers Valiant, De Havilland Comet, English Electric Lightning, several planes. Even this Thrust II vehicle right here was powered and set a land speed record of 633 miles per hour in the Black Rock Desert in Nevada in 1983 famous engine. As we've seen during World War II, Southampton was targeted quite a bit by German bombing and obviously as we've seen in the past a lot of ordnance was not detonated so there were a lot of unexploded bombs that had to be dealt with and 
unfortunately the poor saps that had to do this work were very brave to do this because an unexploded bomb means it's still armed the fuse is still hot it could explode any time so they had to be very careful doing this work because one slip up and this fella would cease to exist unfortunately and I'm sure there were plenty of accidents of course you had to have bomb shelters like bona fide bomb shelters wherever so once the bomber started coming everybody got underground and waited everything to waited for it all to pass just like in London the subways the underground were essentially the city's bomb shelters you had to have something similar in Southampton they even had a new government steel indoor table bomb shelter which I'm not sure how well those worked out especially from fire bombing attacks of course you would also figure the fire department played a heavy role in keeping the city from being completely destroyed fire engines probably ran night and day trying to put out fires especially from incendiary bombardment sometimes the fire bombing was worse than regular explosives here's a model of a how a house would have looked back then with one of those steel shelter setups kind of nerve-wracking to go through your everyday life living around this thing waiting for the event that a bombing run might touch you and that you have to run into this little shelter here and hope that this will be enough to save you of course even during such a negative time people had to try to occupy their time and take their mind off of the hells of war which drinking playing cards and hanging out would have been one of the most likely things to do even back then recycling was pretty important for obvious reasons because you needed vital materials for the war effort I didn't join till 41 when I was 15. Uh, the proper age was supposed to be 17, but they were not too selective, they were not too worried about it. And I went in front of Major Cop first off, and he said, How old are you, son? And I said, 17, sir. He said, Well, you look big enough. Okay, you're in. And uh, for quite some time, I was. Uh, in uh, what they called the infantry. Some few days later, I was issued with a, a full uniform. The only difference with the army uniform was that we had leather anklets and the army had webbing anklets. The regimental badge was the same as the Hampshire regiment, which was a tiger surmounted by a rose, surrounded by a laurel wreath underneath the pigeon Hampshire. It was effectively known by everybody else as the old cat cabbage. I remained as an infantryman there for quite some time, principally guarding the crossing in Redbridge and Redbridge Meadows, also in King George V Dock and Southampton Docks itself and sometimes on uh, duty in the barracks itself overnight. After some couple of years or so, I was transferred uh, to anti-aircraft. Now a well-earned tribute to the men of the anti-aircraft defences who daily win glory in the protection of our land. The boys of the RAF would be first to acclaim the work of our gunners, whose splendid marksmanship is increasingly proving so costly to the raiding Huns. told that the particular weapons we were going on were top secret and we weren't to talk about them at all um, uh, but actually what they were were quite simply rocket guns and uh, the battery that I was uh, involved with was at Marchwood and the battery had 68 guns 64 of those guns were operational four would be used for training 
Each gun fired two rockets. All guns fired simultaneously. So uh, if we got the order to fire, and at no time did we ever fire those in anger, although we wish many times we could have done, uh, you would have had 128 rockets going up all in one go, performing a, what they call a box barrage. Made in Germany, finished in Britain. The tide is turning. Every man and woman, uniformed or working clothed, is in the front line. Crusaders of the home front, the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force fight in the battle for civilization. Hmm. Down on the farm, the land girls are doing their bit and a bit more. And you should see their calves. If you happen to be a calf in Asia these days, you've got all the luck. Before I was called up, I volunteered for the land army because I didn't want to go to a factory and that. So uh, I went into the land army and down to Milford on Sea and became a dairy girl. Milky cows. The forestry girls, they're members of the women's land army. The lumber jills are not expected to be fellows, if you know what I mean. We used to have double summer time, which meant that we were daylight at midnight, and therefore everybody had to work uh, really hard. And I used to be up at half past three, get the cows in, do the milking, wash them all down and wash everything down, finish about eight o'clock, uh, go in for to sleep for half an hour, get up and go out and in the summer it was a much nicer thing because if we had five minutes, we should just sit down and relax in a field. But we worked hard. Don't let anybody tell you the land I didn't, because they certainly did, believe me, till midnight. Midnight, we used to go down to Milford on scene, have a swim, and then back again, straight in bed. Up again at half past three in the morning. That was seven days a week. remember the days of 1940 and 41 when the Luftwaffe nightly visited our cities and towns leaving fire and destruction behind. In quieter times we're apt to forget these firemen and firewomen, then handicapped by inadequate water supplies and lack of standard equipment, who fought and won the first great battle of the war, the Battle of the Plains. They fought not only the fires in their own towns, but often rushed to the assistance of their comrades in other parts of the country. Many were part-timers, who responded to the siren's call after a day's work in our vital factories, offices and shops. The Battle of the Flames taught us the necessity for a national organization with standard training and standard equipment. The 1,400 fire brigades were welded into one hull. Thus was born the National Fire Service. All personnel undergo training at schools in each fire force area. The quick and accurate handling of equipment is practiced. It is necessary to have a thorough knowledge of all the various firefighting appliances. The service demands a high standard of technical efficiency and knowledge. That the science and tactics of firefighting should be discussed, planned and learned. A bitter lesson was learned during the blitzes when water mains were fractured and water supplies, the ammunition of the firemen, failed. So now many miles of pipelines have been laid in our cities and these can be easily repaired to ensure an adequate supply of water to strategic points. Emergency tanks are kept filled and an organization exists for relaying water to them from all available supply. Firemen, skilled building operatives in their peacetime occupation, working under the direction of architects and surveyors, have rebuilt and adapted fire stations. Miniature munition factories have been established at some of the stations. Here, propeller blades are being polished. Another station, old tires are retreaded. The men are always available for a fire call. The nerves 
centers of the service are the control rooms. And here you see a far woman on duty taking a call. From the constant record of appliances available, they order out the first attendants. In this work, under blitz conditions, the women have proved their worth. is quickly surveyed by the officer in charge who then gives his orders to the crews on the appliances. The first thing to discover is whether lives are in danger. high degree of courage to stand on a hundred foot ladder over a fire. Fire boats are sent for as they are most useful on the dock side and at ship fires. Their powerful jets save the work of a large number of men. Fires on ships are most dangerous, but to trained firefighters, difficulties are but a challenge to their determination and skill. Their job is to prevent the fire from spreading. It's a hot and smoky job in the hold of a cargo ship. Thanks to the devilish ingenuity of the enemy, a new terror was the flying bomb. Our anti-aircraft gunners went into action. Our pilots, too, were doing a magnificent job. But some of the flying bombs got through. Men and women of the National Fire Service were called upon once again. A fireman's life is a dangerous one, both in peace and under blitz conditions. This film is dedicated to those hundreds who have given their lives and to those who have been injured fighting the Battle of the Flames. Once again, the King shows his interest in and sympathy for his people in the front line by visiting Southampton shortly after a Nazi blitz. The King praised the ARP workers and said it showed how valuable all the preliminary work was when, before the war, some people were saying it was just a waste of time. The needs of the Civil Defence Service call for the employment of emergency messengers. Their job is to act as dispatch riders, if necessary under raid conditions, in the event of a breakdown of other forms of communication. The lads drawing their equipment are about 17, and they've already completed their training in first aid, firefighting and anti-gas. During the war, I was an ARP warden, and also a dispatch rider on a bicycle. Besides pedal cyclists, motorcyclists are ready for instant action. Wardens fling themselves down as the bomb explodes uncomfortably near. One night when I was dashing around with these dispatches, I came down for Andrew Lane, turned into English Road and fell in a, a bomb crater. And it was black as pitch because we never had no lights on our bicycles. Where the bomb dropped, all the earth was sucked, all brought up in the air and came down again, and it was soft. When you hear the sirens or anti-aircraft guns, you must get under cover at once. You must not stand staring up at the sky. That's the most dangerous thing to do. Take cover at once. But there's no need to rush. If you take things quietly, you will prevent panic in others. If you're in the open with no cover, lie down, preferably in a ditch. Always remember to see that your blackout is as black as soot. But the most important rule of all is never to stand staring at the sky. I was on patrol. I heard the plane coming along in the distance. And on the end of the water edge line, there was a, um, a fire engine. So I thought, oh, I better sit down to this fire engine in case he drops in. And he did drop three bombs on three houses in water edge lane, hmm. which was just about 40 yards away from me. And I was waiting for the fourth one to come down, but it didn't come down. <laughs> it was a bit of luck. Mr. Diggins? Yes, sir. Uh, where were you when the bomb? Well, in bed. Where did you think I was? What happened? And uh, what happened to you? Oh, it blew me out. It blew out of bed. It must have blew me out. Oh, well, no, I don't remember no more. You managed to get uh, out of the house all right? <coughs> uh, and uh, 
has it uh, hurt you at all? Do you feel any effects of it? No, only a bit shook. It's but I had to find my own way out and I was trapped every time and wherever I went. And how do you feel now? And uh, you're still feeling that you... Yes, I'm a on? bit being shaken. I feel all right. Yes. Fine. That's good. The statement made by Mrs. Jiggin is typical of the people in this locality and all over the country. The morale of the people here are wonderful. One of the air raid wardens said to me when I stood over there in my night dress, and no shoes on my feet. <laughs> he, came, he said to me, he said, come along, mother. He said, I'll take you down to the town hall. And I said, what? He said, come along with me and I'll take you down to the town hall. I said, I don't think it matters, boy. I said, it's my home and I'm going to stick it. He said, that's the spirit, that's what I like to hear. I became an air raid warden because my father was a senior inspector. I would go to work in the morning, in the dark, and leave at eight o'clock at night in the dark from work, then go on duty as an air raid warden, and then patrol the streets or knock on the doors for people showing lights. And, and when they put the incendiary bombs down, you had to put them out with sand and bucket. And I went to look after the shelters one night. A bomb hit Shirley Warren School right on the edge of the school, it hit the shelter, full on, small shelter, and my father, that was a senior warden, had had a talk with the field pots on the other side where the shelter was to stop them from going into that shelter and coming up to the shelter that I was in charge of at the top of the school, big long shelters. So therefore, their luck was in because he wouldn't allow them to use that shelter and they were up in the shelter that I was in. When the bomb fell and the ground lifts with you in the shelter, you can feel it like, you know, you're up and down. And um, I had to go outside and find the damage hmm. was, that was done. So I had to tell a lie. Because <laughs> when I went out, there was glass all over the steps. All the tiles were blowing off the, the roofs. Glass all down the road, and that shelter got destroyed completely, mm. and they would be dead. So I went back and they said, oh, what happened? And I just said, well, not much really. So I had to just, you know, leave it at that. Of course, they found out when they went out. So my father really saved their lives. But the most important rule of all is never to stand staring at the sky. If you don't take cover, you may get... <laughs> Our cameraman, Jock Gamble, goes to a Yorkshire colliery to witness the arrival at the pithead of a party of Mr. Bevan's boys. Young conscripts drafted into the mines instead of the armed forces. Like the merchant seamen, their battle dress is an old suit of civilian clothes with the added equipment of their service. Safety helmets and pit boots are part of their kit. My papers came through and said, you've got to register now for your national service in the forces. I went to Ryslip, which is the place I had to attend to, to register. And uh, I always remember him saying to me, oh, hard luck, chum, you've been balloted to go in the coal mines. I said, what? Oh, no, 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 so I'm going to the RAF. I'm, I'm ex-air um, training corps. They said, well, sorry, it, your number's been drawn. And these numbers were drawn every fortnight. It was based on the last digit of your registration number. If that coincided with the number drawn, you were in the coal mines. And that's what happened to me. This latest development of the nation's manpower has a great influence on the battlefronts overseas. Black ammunition arrives in Italy from Britain. Coal for the running of locomotives left behind intact by the retreating enemy. Every ounce of it helps to put rolling stock back on the lines for the transport of essential supplies to our armies in the field. Those lads in the mines may not look at it like this, but they're hewing away into occupied Europe. Observer Corps was a volunteer organisation which by the end of World War II stretched from Duncansby Head in Northern Scotland near John and Groats to St Mary's in the Scilly Isles. When the story of the war comes to be written, prominent place must be given to the men who in all weathers are doing a job that is as important as it's unspectacular. 
Such a scene may be all very well for Christmas cards, but it's not so thrilling if you have to tramp through it to get to your post. That is, if you're a member of the Observer Corps. From their lonely eyes, they keep a ceaseless watch on the skies, one a spotter and the other a teller. Most of the observers do their work in their spare time, and the post is manned continuously morning, noon, and night. The ideal, really, was to give a report on the aircraft with the position on the, on the chart table and so on, and immediately an adjacent post would give a report. And then you had what was known as a cross plot. And where the two crossed was the accurate position of the aircraft above the ground. We were given silhouette cards so we could look and see what the airplane was, but where I was, it, it was, wasn't necessary. They were told you, if they knew it, they told you, and we told them and they put a ticket on. If not, they said it was unknown or something. I mean, there were tollmen, there were electricians, there were shopkeepers, there were shop staff, office workers. Sometimes at night time, I would go and sit down at the seat and nothing would happen. Bar, just an odd track going across. But at some night, you sat, sat down at midnight and it went on all night long. Somewhere in England, the watchers read the skies. The teller can telephone direct to the local centre if the spotter has anything to report. Quickness of eye and a sense of alertness are two essential qualities in men of the Observer Corps, to say nothing of keen hearing. They are often able to identify an invisible plane by the peculiar note of the engine. If you were lucky enough to see it, you could identify it. If you couldn't, what does it sound like? Is it single engine, twin engine? And some of us were very good, very good at identifying aircraft by sound. But if it was seen, it was tracked until we couldn't see it, or until we crossed another line of posts which we had on our table. It is these men who take on the great responsibility of spotting and reporting the movements of enemy aircraft. They are the country's eyes and ears. The Corps made a major contribution in the tracking and the downing of the Messerschmitt 110, Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess. That's a major story in itself. But it is during the Battle of Britain, when the radar stations had been knocked out by Hitler's Luftwaffe, that the Royal Observer Corps earned its reputation as the eyes and ears of the RAF, contributing so significantly to the defeat of the Luftwaffe that King George later awarded the Corps its royal title. In recognition of the valuable services of the Observer Corps, His Majesty has approved that in future it be known as the Royal Observer Corps. After years of devoted and arduous service, the announcement by the Secretary of Air brings the Corps out of obscurity into the limelight it so nobly deserves. Founded originally as a civilian body of special constables before the war, the Royal Observer Corps holds a highly skilled and essential position in the defense of Britain. In all weathers and for all times of the day and night, they take on their great responsibility. ROC, a rock firm in Britain's defense. We have every reason to be proud of the men of the Royal Observer Corps. They're grand fellas. Have a little model here of a makeshift shelter made out of corrugated steel <clears throat> with bunks inside of it like a makeshift camp set up which if your house was destroyed this would probably be where you'd be staying women played a role in the war effort working the farms making sure that food and other vital supplies made their way to the front lines and of course at home civil defense was very important everything from making sure cities were blacked out when need be at night so the bombers wouldn't have anywhere to target we had observer royal observer corps whose job was to look out and spot any aircraft come and identify them and relay the messages back so proper action can be taken and the home guard they were the armed citizen militia sort of like the national guard in america to a lesser degree they weren't soldier soldiers they were just civilians that were the last line of defense in the event of an invasion actually had improvised weapons here if an invasion ever occurred everybody was pretty much going to be a soldier on the front lines 
the fire departments pretty much ran night and day because of the incendiary bombing. As stated before, fire could sometimes be more of a dangerous weapon than explosives. Of course, the police had to play a role too besides regular crime prevention. They had to make sure that wartime regulations were followed so no slip-ups can occur that might result in more casualties. Their duties involved sounding of air raid sirens, enforcing blackouts, helping people to find shelter, helping to rescue people, prevention of looting after buildings have been bombed, recovering prisoners of war who might have escaped, monitoring foreigners in case they were spies, supervising the public with the use of gas masks and other civil defense issues, visiting schools to inform children on gas drills and dangers of bombs. Got a good vantage point of our beachcomber airliner from up high, along with the uh, racing seaplane and the Spitfire. along with a, a biplane. Got a model of a mechanic working on one of the engines of the beachcomber plane as well. We even have a hang glider. All the planes we saw earlier, we get to see from up high. concept of airliners was not a new idea. started in 1912, just around the same time that aircraft really started coming to the forefront. A lot of these were converted from military aircraft. In the case of a supermarine channel in 1919, Sea Eagle in 1923. Imperial Airways. Supermarine Sea Eagle and the vast short Solent. Supermarine Commercial Amphibian. Purpose built. Early attempt at a purpose built flying boat. They only went short distances in the very beginning, but it was a start. Imperial Airways from 24 to 36 continued services between Southampton and the Channel Islands till 29 and of course even the mail took advantage of aircraft technology as stated using amphibians for Aircraft in commercial purposes or even military purposes is a pretty smart idea. If the area is too small for a land runway, but there's plenty of water, you've got runway all around you. Just like right here. Right off the shore, you use the whole length of water you need to take off. Of course, they had to reserve a certain area of the harbor for flying boats to prevent accidents with shipping. Imperial Airways boats, flying boats travel as far as Australia and New Zealand in the east, South Africa and the Americas in the west. Huh. Many flying boats were given names that reflected their destinations. The biggest and most luxurious of, of these was the short Solent. Interior included a cocktail bar and ladies powder room. <laughs> of course, during the war, commercial air traffic stopped, and everything went to military roles. Flying boat services returned to Southampton in March 1948. In 49, the Hythe Base was headquarters to the BOAC Number no. 4 line. BOAC stopped operation in 1950 flying boat services that is base 
their base operations finally closed down in May of 57. Another spot at birth 50 had operations and they ended in 1950. In May of 1951, BOAC withdrew from Hyatt and left the base under government control. The first short solent flying boat to be bought by Aquila took over the Southampton Madeira route in 51. In 52, the route was extended to the Canary Islands after a Sydney flying boat crashed into a disused chalk pit on the Isle of Wight. In 57, 1957, it killed 38 people, and that just expedited the end of the flying boats as commercial airliners. Of course, at the time, the flying boats were almost like the luxury liners of the commercial airliner world. Had everything from sleeping berths to reclining seats, which was something new for the time. Even when they stopped at different points, the passengers get to stay at luxurious hotels and get to do a little sightseeing along the way. But as land-based aircraft became faster, the flying boats were kind of pushed out of the way. But some people still preferred the flying boats because, again, they traveled in a aura of luxury. Avro 504 trainer biplane what's in front of us right here kind of an interesting thing the model shows the pilots holding handheld bombs showing how the very first bombing was done with handheld bombs dropped from the cockpit in fact that was a mission that was taken out in November of 1914 by Supermarine founder Noel Pemberton Billing. He took four Avro 504s to France for the world's first strategic bombing campaign. Only three of the planes were able to continue 125 miles along the Swiss border towards Germany. After 11 they were flying over Lake Constance first Avro dropped its bombs but the pilot was wounded by anti-aircraft fire and captured. The second dropped bombs on a zeppelin shed damaging the airship inside and the hydrogen plant. After evading anti-aircraft fire they escaped to safety. The third one arrived under a bunch of anti-aircraft fire. The bombs were dropped on the zeppelin sheds and the aircraft flew close to the ground to avoid machine gun fires that headed back over Lake Constance. Surviving crew headed to England the following day and welcomed back with open arms. They were equipped with 20 pound bombs of limited effectiveness, but it was still a turning point. Here's an interesting plane. It looks like a quad plane, four wings instead of three or two. Haven't seen one of these before. A bunch of models of different aircraft on both sides of the conflict. World War I. <laughs> Interesting little piece of information. In April 1917, an SOS was received from an Italian ship warning of a U-boat attack. Curtis H-12 Large America Flying Boat discovered the U-boat on the surface and dropped a couple bombs on its conning tower. Submarine submerged, but it was wounded because oil and bubbles were seen spreading from its last location. A destroyer call was called in and recited the U-boat and depth charger. Then a uh, Royal Naval Air Service white seaplane sighted the submarine UB-32 in the English Channel. The sub dived but was lost. Of course, early submarines couldn't stay submerged for long. And the same aircraft spotted the sub again and sank her with a 100-pound bomb dropped forward of the periscope. First submarine to be sunk by a British plane. We 
Yep. Of course, during World War One, which was a war of technological innovation with the use of all types of new gadgets and devices for the destruction of life and property, planes, submarines, machine guns, you name it, but uh, submarines especially were used by the Germans heavily. At one point, submarines used to give merchant ships time to abandon ship and for the crew to get to some sort of safety near shore or whatever before their ships were sunk but Q ships which were more or less merchant ships with hidden guns used to ambush warships submarines that is change those rules and at that point Germany pretty much called off their prize rules and just sunk all ships without warning which included the Lusitania a luxury liner similar to the Titanic and of course the key point that brought America into World War I of course by that time merchant ships had to travel in convoys protected by warships to somewhat be safe from the U-boats then eventually aircraft started to take a role in reconnaissance as well as offensive operations against the U-boats here's another interesting display Southampton University man-powered aircraft in 1961. They built in the Tizard building. The plane was, the acronym was SUMPAC, S-U-M-P-A-C. Had an 80-foot wingspan, was pedal-driven, and had a propeller mounted on a pylon above the wing. Right there. A large wingspan to catch enough air to get off the ground with minimal effort and it was pedal powered pretty slick here's a funny looking little airplane called the flying flea home built aircraft of the 30s not easy to fly hard to handle 20 foot wingspan had a 650 cc engine like a little motorcycle engine this little plane right here the Britain Norman BN1. Another little small open seat airplane. Still didn't catch a glimpse of a placard for this helicopter, but helicopters are always cool to check out, even if you don't know what they are. An added bonus to the museum is a police museum, which we're fixing to walk on inside. Got a lot of uh, different stuff, police and fire museum it actually is. All kinds of models and different items that were used. Fire boats, police boats, radios and equipment <laughs> even pagers other communications equipment of course as technology advanced so did the equipment they used like the radios some of the older stuff right here this is a pretty wild story Percy Topless the monocled mutineer body of Sidney George Spicer was found. He'd been shot in the head. He was a taxi driver who had collected a fare from the night before. Apparently, he had collected a fare from another dude dressed in RAF uniform and an investigator who was working on the case that he, <clears throat> he determined that Spicer had been robbed and his taxi stolen. That's the name of the guy. Sidney George Spicer was robbed and his taxi stolen. The taxi, a 12 horsepower motor car, D Dirac, was found abandoned. Then a soldier from the army camp came forward saying he'd been at the camp and was with a colleague, Percy Francis Topless, 
who arrived in the car, which he realized was a stolen taxi, after part and company, and finding out who the individual the cops were looking for was, they started hunting him down. Next positive sighting was in Scotland when he shot and injured police constable George Grieg, Greig and a gamekeeper, John Grant, who tried to detain him for breaking into a farmer's hut. After the guy escaped five days later, he was challenged by the local constable, Albert Fulton, and was threatened to be shot at again. Fulton withdrew and got together a posse of uh, police who came in as he was walking down the A6 towards Penrith, He was challenged by two armed officers, and gunfire ensued. Topless received a single gunshot to the chest, killing him instantly. It was determined that he was lawfully shot by the police carrying out their duties. It says that it's been written that Topless' alleged involvement in a mutiny in France during the war, but there's no evidence to support that story. In books and films, he's depicted as a pacifist anti-establishment hero and ringleader of a mutiny at the coastal town of Itapolis, south of Boulogne. I'm probably butchering all the names of these towns. And between the 9th and 12th of September 1917, where thousands of Allied troops were being trained and prepared for an offensive, troops revolted. <clears throat> against the brutal conditions and inhuman treatment meted out to them by the military police and instructors. Apparently, Topless and his uh, cohorts took the general and his officers and bundled them into a room and more or less threatened to burn them alive. And then when they agreed to surrender, within 10 minutes and freed, the mob threw them into the river. Well, then six days of riots followed, which immobilized 100,000 men and undermined the war effort. Commanding officers were treated with utter contempt, violent insubordination. As thousands of soldiers rampaged through the town, raping women and slaughtering MPs. Piece of history that nobody's probably ever known about. Making our way through. This is interesting. They actually had petrol testing. An electric device to measure the content and determine if specific oils and petroleum products were legal or not. I guess it heated it up and based on the viscosity of it, it made it determine whether it was legal or not. I guess the, the different blends reacted a certain way trying to read this thing here to determine that embodies electrical heating and ignition viscosimeters yeah measured the viscosity based on the temperature it was heated to got our fella on the horse here and a lot of trophies and awards for the different groups within the fire and police departments At this fella right here. Of course, we have some tools of the trade, different handcuffs and billy clubs, different hats, whistles. We also have different uniforms of police and fire staff, even the women. More tools of the firefighting trade. We have a, I'm assuming this is going to be a water pump. Yeah. A little gas powered water pump. Like a little four cylinder engine. Yep. For pumping water in areas where you have a water source. Some little models over here. Vehicles that are used in the fire department. More equipment. 
and even more equipment. Fire nozzles, hoses and nozzles and whatnot. Or the nozzles for the hoses, that is. We have a little display right here showing a more primitive water pump setup operated by two dudes. Another one right here, same thing. And we have some motorcycles here, police motorcycles. A BMW. Little call boxes for police and fire and ambulance. Now we have the uh, ass kickers right here with the dog. Like the stuff for the. Uh, CSI guys Another pump The Tilly pump 18th century actually huh. More firefighting uniforms and gear Some more memorabilia on the firefighting end. More stuff. All the different medals and rank markings. A couple of pictures here. Wartime art. More medals and medallions. bugles and instruments that they've used police band more models uniform jackets more helmets and hats a lot of little stuff to look at even a little prison with these two saps inside. You get to sit in a prison with these two saps. Look at this. They even have their little piss pot right here. Well, that pretty much concludes the police and fire museum portion of the overall museum. Pretty cool little setup showing all the different hardware and stuff. Definitely worth the visit. Some more little models, different aircraft. Always like models. Even more models. Had some squadrons that were formed in Southampton in 1941. After the war, two of them were disbanded, leaving the 424 to continue. They occupied some of these buildings in 84 till 84 then moved to their present headquarters which is in this museum 
Not much is known about the other squadrons. As we can clearly see, Southampton has a lot of history covering all kinds of areas. Land, sea, air, war, peace, all across the board.